we got a lot going on in the world right now. There's an awful lot going on. The title of my message this morning is Open Your Bible. It's time to open your Bible. It's time for everybody to open their Bible because it just seems like that we, we look around and see what's happening in the world. Um, there's a lot of things going on. And there's a lot of things going on in our individual lives also. Uh, some of the pictures that I have put together for today's presentation, we've seen a lot of this lately, haven't we? There's a lot of fear, and that's why I chose this particular text for this morning that, um, from 1 John, that perfect love casts out fear. In fact, Jesus told us that he was going to leave us peace when he went back to his father after his resurrection. Leave us peace, but not peace like the world thinks of peace. A peace that transcends the things that happen on this earth. Uh, here, here's a few more pictures I want to share with you. If I get the clicker to work, I wonder if we need to replace the batteries in this thing. You know, this, I'm sure this shot came from China somewhere. But, you know, the CDC, the Centers for Con Disease Control, warned that there might be these type of things happening coming to this country. The interruption of everyday life because of what we see around the world. This is a screenshot I took last night of, um, it's a compilation of everything happening in the world about this coronavirus. It's from Johns Hopkins University. The big red number on the upper left-hand corner tells you how many cases there are worldwide. And the white number on the right, the, on the right side, that tells you how many people have died and the green number tells you how many have recovered. And it, it's updated quite frequently throughout every day, so it's a, it's a running total. On the left-hand column underneath the, the 85,000 number, that's, that's the worldwide number, you can click on a particular country and see how many people are infected with that, with the coronavirus. But it doesn't just stop with this latest round of fear. Um, the earthquakes that we've seen, I know, Pamela, you said there was an earthquake not too long ago in Jamaica, and where you're from. And, and you, you told us they never have earthquakes in Jamaica. That struck me when you said that. And the kind of winter that we've had, the summers that we've had, here's just a screenshot of things out of whack with our weather. And it just seems like there's an awful lot to be afraid of. There's an awful lot to be afraid of. And my point this morning is, it's time to figure out what God wants to tell each one of us individually. It's time now to be right with God individually. It's time now to open our Bibles and find out what God is saying to each one of us. It's time to open our Bibles. I want to go to an Old Testament account. Let me just give you a little background. I've, I've talked about this particular prophet from the Old Testament many times. And I, I think it's a prophet mo most people have heard about. His name is Elijah. And I think most people recognize, if they know anything about Scripture, that Elijah did a pretty good job of doing what God wanted him to do. There was an evil king in Israel at that time, and he married someone outside of the faith, so to speak. He married, his name was Ahab, and he married this woman named Jezebel. You don't hear a, lot, a whole lot of young ladies being named Jezebel because of the connotation that comes straight from Scripture. And Jezebel just forced Ahab's hand 
all the time. She worshiped these false gods and she made Ahab set up all these false gods throughout all of his territory. And it came time for God to do something about it. So he sent Elijah, his prophet. And when Elijah came to Ahab, it, he didn't really meet with the king right away. He met with someone else. And, and this someone else said, Elijah, you're, you're going to be, the king's going to kill you. He's going to kill me if I give him the message. You better give him the message yourself. And Ahab said, no, no, I'm on a message from God. I have nothing to be afraid about. I have spent time with God, knowing what he wants me to do. And that's what I'm encouraging us to do, like Elijah. Let's open our Bibles and find out what God wants for us, what he wants us to know. So Elijah gave the message to the king. He said, it's not, it's not gonna rain in all of the land. There's gonna be a, a horrible drought until you, Something else is going to happen that's going to turn your mind, turn your heart back to God. Israel's going to have to decide whether they're going to worship the true God or they're going to worship these false gods that Jezebel has brought in. So Elijah disappeared for three years. The Bible says there wasn't just rain. It wasn't just limited to no rain, but there was no dew in the land. For three years. You know, we can get a lot of moisture out of the air. The scripture says there was no dew, not let alone rain. And it finally started to hurt. God was telling his chosen people, look, you've, you've got to do what is right. You know what is right. Come back to me. You know, I think God, on a personal level, God puts us through things from time to time that are really going to turn us one way or the other. We're going to turn to him and find out what he wants, or our hearts are going to be hardened because of the difficult things we go through. We have a choice to make at those times. And so did King Ahab and Jezebel, his queen. But it came time for all of Israel to decide whether they were going to follow God or not. And I put a few of those texts from uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 here up on the screen. Uh, let me move right on. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Let me, let me set it up for you. So there hadn't been any rain. And Ahab has been searching for Elijah to put to death this prophet because he's the one that's troubling Israel, right? No, Ahab is the one that's been troubling Israel. And so finally, Elijah comes to Ahab and says, get all of Israel together. We're going to settle this thing once and for all. Go up on top of Mount Carmel with all of the Israelites, thousands and thousands of people. And we're going to see what's going to happen. And when they all got assembled, Elijah said to all the false prophets of Baal and all the other gods, he said, I'll give you all day. You take your sacrifice and you make your altar and you pray to your false gods and we'll see what happens. Well, that's what they did all day long. Those false prophets prayed to their false gods and nothing happened. And that's when this takes place that's up on the screen. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I've done all these things at your word, your word. He knew what the word of God said. 
Then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up all the water that they had poured on it that was in the trench around it. Fire came down from heaven. Fire came down from heaven. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. They were making a choice because they'd seen with their own eyes fire come out of down from heaven and consume the burnt offering. Woohoo! Can you imagine what Elijah feels like? It worked. All the things God had told him about no rain, it worked. Whew. I'm good. That's what Elijah thinking, right? I'm good. Everything's good. In fact, they took all these false prophets and they took them down by the brook and they put them all to death because they weren't going to repent. God told Elijah to put all these false prophets to death and that's what he did. And then back up on the mountain, he tells Ahab, look, you better get ready because it's going to rain. And Ahab had a little meal, a little something to drink. And they saw the cloud out there. There hadn't been even clouds in the area. Remember, there was no dew. There hadn't even been clouds in the area. They see this little cloud away far off. And so Elijah, in his faith, leads Ahab's chariot down the mountain so he can be safe because it just poured buckets of rain. Because the people had decided that Jehovah was the true God. Woohoo! Everything's good with Elijah. Everything's good with Elijah, the true prophet of God. He's got nothing to worry about. In fact, he faithfully obeyed God and did what God told him to do. He's got nothing to worry about. How many of you know the rest of the story? Well, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. And it, this is the verse that it starts out with. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets of Baal, it's talking about with the sword. Uh-oh. What's going to happen now? But remember, Elijah's a faithful prophet. He wouldn't be fearful at all, right? Not afraid, not in the least, no matter what happens. If I live or if I die, Paul says, it will all be glory to God. No matter what God decides for this life I have now, it'll all be okay. In verse 2 of 1 Kings 19, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, if I don't kill you by this time tomorrow, May the gods kill me. That's what Jezebel sent to Elijah. It's okay, right? It's okay. Elijah has nothing to worry about. He's done what God has asked him to do. But that isn't what Elijah shows in his faith. Elijah runs. Verse 3, And when he saw that, or heard the message, he arose and went for his life. He came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. Look, I'm going to make it so you can't follow me. I'm, I, my servant might make a mistake, but I'm going to leave him here. I'm just going to go on alone. That way they'll never be able to find me. That's exactly what he does. Forty days and forty nights later, he finds himself in a cave. Do you think Elijah, 
Do you think he really wanted to know what God was thinking at this point? Why did he have this lack of faith? He'd seen fire come down from heaven. Don't you think he ought to reconnect with the word of God? Because in here we find so many promises that no matter what goes wrong or what goes right in our lives, God's got a plan for you and for me as individuals. He does. I don't think it was God's plan that Elijah should run for his life. You know, God just doesn't leave him sit in the cave Verse 9, he came into a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Isn't that interesting? We call this the word of God, don't we? And he said unto him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been very jealous for you, Lord of hosts. Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down your altars, and they've slain your prophets with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and they seek to take my life. Well, later on in the chapter, God tells him, you may think that's the case, but I've got 7,000 people in Israel who never bowed their knees to these false gods. That's what God tells him later on in the chapter. Even though Elijah ran for his life, God still wants him to be his prophet. You know, there are some times in life where we make mistakes, where we look to the wrong thing to solve our problems, to make it easier for ourselves even though we're having difficulty. We look inside instead of to God's word. We look to what the world has to offer to run away from the things that are going on in our lives. God told him to go stand on, out on the mountain out in front of the cave. And there was a strong wind Verse 11, but God was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake, it says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And verse 12 says, after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And verse 13 says, and it was so. And when Elijah heard that still small voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, God has a way of getting through to each one of us individually. God knew just what Elijah needed to see and hear. Because after Elijah had witnessed this fire come down from heaven in front of all of Israel and the king, his faith should have been the strongest that it ever was. God showed him all of his power, right? He showed him in the whirlwind. He showed him in the earthquake. He showed him in the fire. God can do anything. But you know, in the still, small voice, in the time when you and I open the word of God, and we just read a few things that God has prepared for you and I, that's when God can really speak to you and I. That's when God is the most powerful in our lives, when we listen to what he has to say through his word. All these crazy things happening in the world today, it seems like very easily our society could be turned upside down. What are we going to do? To whom would we go? I 
I want to turn back to the New Testament. I have a few scriptures left on the screen. It's not, not a very long sermon today. It's going to come to an end quickly. Because I think my point has been made. If we take time to connect with God in the ways that he can speak with us, and the number one way is for us to open our Bibles and start reading, start thinking about what we're reading. If we connect with God in that way, we don't have to fear anything that's going to happen in this life. We don't, we don't need to fear the coronavirus. We don't need to fear these earthquakes. We don't need to fear the weather, weather patterns that are upending all over the globe. In John chapter 11, Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. John 11, 23 and 24, and Jesus is talking to Martha. Verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha saith unto him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Verse 25, and Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You see, to whom will we go? It's about someone, not a place. Elijah was running away from someone and something to a place where he could get away. Verse 26 says, Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, I don't think Jesus was talking about the life we're living right now. I know that Jesus is talking about the eternal life that we've been promised if we just seek him out. If we put our Heavenly Father first in everything that we do, that's the life he's talking about. And even though his friend Lazarus was dead and he resurrected him right there, right there that day on the spot, what he's promised us is that if we live and believe in the Son of God, we don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about the Ahabs and the Jezebels in our lives. We don't have to worry about the coronavirus. No matter if it's real or it's a political agenda, we're all going to have to deal with the effects of it. That's true. But we don't have anything to worry about. if we're in Christ Jesus, living and believing in him. Here's another text I want to share with you right in the end. 1 Peter 3, 12 and 3, 13. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good. But if, but, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does that mean? Build a relationship with him. Build a relationship with him. And be ready always to give an answer to everybody out there, to every man that asks you for a reason of this hope that you have in God with meekness and fear. We don't have anything to worry about. What we need to do is open our Bibles because that's how we're going to find a relationship with our Heavenly Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 
I want to give you some homework this week because I'm going to be preaching next week to you. I would like you all to read Psalm chapter 91. Psalm chapter 91. And if you forget that, just text me and I'll remind you. Okay. Psalm chapter 91 is, is really important in the days and times that we're living in today. Our memory text this morning that Ed read was, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You know, God is described, described in the Bible as the personification of love. God is love. If we have a relationship with God, if we're resting in God through his son, Jesus Christ, we have nothing to fear whatsoever. But it takes us opening our Bibles to find out who God is. 